day 932 of the Trump administration finds our president on vacation in New Jersey while our politics remain a mess. Still torn up by sadness and anger over two mass shootings just last weekend that left a death toll of 31 souls. En route to his golf resort, the president stopped in the Hamptons on Long Island for fundraisers, accompanied by protesters along the way. The Trump White House is now directly confronted by the twin issues of unchecked gun violence in this country and full-on domestic terrorism, which at its worst is echoing language used by the president. And it looks like we may have perhaps stopped the next one. Late today, the FBI announced the arrest in Las Vegas of a 23-year-old who authorities say was promoting white supremacist ideology. They say he had illegal firearms and bomb-making materials and was planning to attack synagogues and a gay bar. Hours earlier, authorities revealed the suspect in the El Paso shooting had confessed to targeting Mexicans using an AK-47 assault rifle in the attack last Saturday. It was just this past Monday, remember, when Trump delivered remarks from a teleprompter on this topic from the White House. We are outraged and sickened by this monstrous evil, the cruelty, the hatred, the malice, the bloodshed, and the terror. The shooter in El Paso posted a manifesto online consumed by racist hate. In one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. Hate has no place in America. Trump then visited Dayton and El Paso, where so many local officials and some public officials made it clear he was not welcome. While leaving the White House for vacation this morning, the president told reporters he's now focused on expanding background checks, even though he has backed off supporting that in the past. I think we can get something really good done. I think we can have some really meaningful background checks. We don't want people that are mentally ill, people that are are sick. We don't want them having guns. Who does? National Rifle Association CEO Wayne LaPierre is said to have already warned Trump about pushing for those reforms. But today, the president insisted LaPierre and Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell are ready to work with him. A spokesperson for McConnell tells NBC News he, quote, has not endorsed any specific gun legislation. And you'll note the majority leader was sounding a bit cautious in a Kentucky radio interview just yesterday. Begin the discussions during the uh, the August break, and when we get back, hopefully we'll be in a position to agree on things. It's always hard at the federal level because we have to synthesize uh, views from a whole lot of different points of view, not just the two uh, political parties, but uh, the different parts of the country. You know, a t- t- totally different views on an issue like this. Earlier on this network, former Republican, former Florida Congressman David Jolly once again summed up the challenges that lawmakers face when it comes to real gun reform. This debate is 10 years in the making and is rife with pitfalls, and nobody has used the political capital to actually get there. And, of course, what we did not hear is any mention of banning weapons of war. So the president will play the showman in this debate and suggest he's leading, but there really is little leadership in terms of political capital. One more item from this week that is just getting talked about today. This is the photo from the First Lady's Twitter feed. That baby the Trumps are posing with is the infant that survived but lost both of his parents who were killed while shielding him at the Walmart. The baby's uncle, apparently a supporter of the president, and the family thus agreed to bring the child in for the photo. Here for our leadoff discussion on a Friday night, Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times, Ashley Parker, Pulitzer Prize winning White House reporter for The Washington Post and Franco Ordonez, White House correspondent for NPR. Good evening and welcome to you all. Peter, a tough question to start off with as the president starts his vacation. Where in his presidency does this week rank uh, among its challenges? 
Well, you know, it's interesting. We, 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 we ask this question a lot because every week it almost seems like we are reaching new levels and new scales of, of, of challenges, to use your word, of crises, of, of uh, you know, uh, unbelievable moments that uh, have shocked the nation or otherwise challenged the political system. And yet then the next one comes along. And we see another and another. And I think what we're seeing now, of course, is really we're on the launch pad for the election next year. And this gun debate is going to be part of it. This debate about the presidency and his words is going to be part of it. This debate about white supremacy, race, all of this is part of the mix. And it's, it, it, it's, it, these are ingredients for a pretty toxic con, uh, you know, conversation that we're about to have as a country. Uh, Ashley Parker, I know you were on the trip in question. A lot of reporting emerging from the trip and the behind the scenes. Uh, this is some of what The Times has written tonight. By the time President Trump arrived in El Paso on Wednesday, he was frustrated that his attacks on his political adversaries had resulted in more coverage than the cheery reception he received at a hospital in Dayton, Ohio, the first stop on his trip. So he screamed at his aides to begin producing proof that in El Paso, people were happy to see him. Uh, Ashley, we did indeed see the result of that rant, apparently. What else can you fill in about the trip and what you've learned? Well, that's exactly correct. That that was our reporting and our understanding as well. Um, I was traveling with the president. The first stop in Dayton, uh, we expected to be allowed in to see some of that hospital visit, and we weren't. Um, we were frustrated by that because, of course, we always want access. And as it turns out, the president was frustrated as well because there was a carefully curated group there. The White House sort of put it out in propaganda photos and images that they carefully curated. And the president was frustrated that the media was not reporting on that. And on Air Force One, as we were flying from Dayton to El Paso, um, Fox News, of course, was playing, and it was playing footage of a press conference um, that Senator Shura Brown and the Dayton mayor had, and the president was unhappy that that was the focus and not him. And so by the time we got to El Paso, our understanding was he had yelled at AIDS. He actually said to the media in El Paso, we were finally allowed to see something, not in the hospital, but at the second event he did, which was at a sort of first responders command center, he said, I wish you had been with us. I wish you could have seen the, basically the love and the respect they had for the presidency. Um, and that was our understanding as well. And it's worth mentioning, on our flight back home, he came back and he spoke to the press uh, on Air Force One for 45 minutes. It was off the record, so obviously we can't discuss what he said. We sort of got the sense, just in the mere fact that he came back, that he was eager to be in front of the media and get his message and his account of the day out. Franco, a lot of people saw on social media today a four-way split of still pictures showing presidents uh, comforting uh, the aggrieved. Uh, 43, Bill Clinton. Uh, Obama and then President uh, Trump with the dual thumbs up, the kind of imagery that he will find maddening, no doubt. But I ask, absent any attitude, what did people expect? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I think this visit really showed uh, the challenge that Trump has uh, has had kind of playing this comfort in, comforter in chief role. He's kind of been very resistant to it for that. He's got this kind of image. Uh, he plays this kind of role of a tough guy. Um, and it really, you know, that bravado really gives it gives him a hard time trying to kind of turn the page when he's trying to be sympathetic. Um, you showed the, the pictures of, of him, you know, with his thumbs up with the child. You know, just reminds me also in Puerto Rico during the hurricane victims, he's throwing paper towels at the victims um, in, in Charlottesville, uh, a little bit different on it with involving the white supremacist rally. A woman dies uh, and he's saying there's good, uh, fine people on both sides. So he's really kind of struggled in that role. Um, and I think this was another example of that. Peter Baker, again, from your paper privately, Mr. Trump has recently told advisors that he believes the NRA is going bankrupt after internal upheaval at the organization, and he thinks they won't have the financial means to harm him during the reelection campaign. That may be the new definition of transactional, Peter. Well, look, he, you know, he's not wrong that the NRA is in the middle of a pretty uh, tough internal uh, moment where they've been at each other's throats over money, over leadership, over direction. Uh, and, you know, you don't know whether that will impact their ability to influence elections next year, which is the key 
uh, question, of course, but it is interesting because it does suggest that the president perhaps might be willing to, to take them on in a way he hasn't in the past. But before we get too far in that, let's remember he has been on this position before. He has taken, he, he used to be a Democrat, he used to be pro gun control, uh, and then he would back off. He used to be, you know, even just during his presidency after the Parkland shooting in Florida, he said he would, you know, force uh, tougher gun rules over the objections of the NRA, and then he backed off. And so now he's saying he's going to, uh, you know, pursue some more uh, background checks. We don't know how extensive they would be. Would they be cosmetic or would it be real? And would he follow through on it? The, the, the fact that Congress is not coming back right away is a sign because what happens after these terrible tragedies is there's this, you know, outrage in society. There's this desire to do something. There's this political appetite for action. Uh, and then it tends to fade. It tends to fade within weeks pretty quickly in our in our mass media, you know, accelerated 24-7 culture. So if they wait until September to come back, will the political pressure be the same as it feels today on the president to take action, even if at, it, it causes him discomfort with his allies in the NRA? Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.